So the framework for the following discussion, we'll talk about the demand pull and the supply response. Just walk me through where we are with both. Okay, when we think about on the, the positive side of the ledger, we have seen a two things. An upward revision to 2016 demand levels. Yeah. And also very positive macro data that suggests there's upside risk in growth to demand in 2017. Also on the positive ledger, uh, you've had core OPEC, Saudi and the rest of the Gulf states, compliance much better than what we thought. Now, that's on the positive ledger. On the negative ledger, particularly in the U.S., the supply response seems to be gaining momentum much faster than what we thought to the higher prices. Two reasons. One is productivity gains, but also access to capital. You put it all together, we didn't change our forecast because the positive things offset the negative things, and we end up really in the same place, and we're confident that you're going to see those inventory draws come to Q. Okay, so that confidence, you put up that equation, it equals backwardation in a curve that does this. Right. Is that right. what we're looking for? To Absolutely. Happen? And so while we have prices only showing a modest appreciation up to 57.50, the real core of our view is that transition into a backward data curve. And last week we saw Brent flirting with it. We're getting close, which tells you that the global underlying fundamentals are much more supportive. And so when we think about what generates returns from a commodity investment, it's that positive carry that's generated from the backwardation. So you buy out on the forward curve and roll up the curve. So just to be clear, when people say there's no volatility out anywhere, that you can't make money, it's difficult to make money, you're saying that actually look at this and you can? We go back to 2012 and 13. It was a period when the oil price started the year at something like $110.60 and finished the year at $110.50. But you were backwardated over that time period and you still generated an 11% annualized return over that time period. We think we're going into a very similar environment. So Jeff, when you go to clients and you talk about this view, what's the biggest pushback? What's the big headwind to this actually happening? I, I would argue that there's a view that the supply response will likely overwhelm any type of demand increase and you end up with weaker prices. And I, I want to actually go to a broader point here. Please do. Is that we look at this market, and I did a survey of our clients actually down in Houston last week, and I asked them, where do you see long-term oil prices? And you know what was surprising about that? And this is Houston, that 90% of the people were between $55 and $65 a barrel. That's impressive because you go back three or four years ago, that was probably a $50 ban. You go back 10 years ago, a $100 ban. What, why am I bringing this up? Because we're getting a consensus on long-term oil prices. And what does that tell you? There's no more uncertainty about where the supply is going to come from. So what does that tell you? All prices need to do is get up above the cost level of that certain supply source to be able to stimulate the investment. So why are we bullish if we have a certain supply source? This was exactly the setup of the 80s and 90s. We weren't worried about where the supply was going to come from. All you need to do is see front end prices rise above that cost structure to be able to bring on investment. But why can we remain bullish? is because demand continues to grow, again, in that second half of the business yeah. cycle where demand levels are been getting higher and higher and supply is continuing playing catch up. I would like to point out, when these markets go into a deficit, they stay in a deficit for several years. When they go into a surplus, they stay in a surplus for several years because once supply gets above demand or supply gets um, um, above demand, it's a very difficult challenge for the market to shift back in either, either to a surplus or deficit. So just to be clear, you don't believe the story that the rigs are going to come back on aggressively if we do get this bullish oil scenario? We believe it. In fact, we have just, if we did in the piece just now, we upgraded our outlook on U.S. production such that we expect to see 850,000 barrels per day year over year growth at the end of this year. That's a big number. Yeah. But we, at the same time, updated our demand levels. And I want to go back to this point about demand levels. Really why you see an outperformance of commodities in the second half of a business cycle, which we believe we're entering right now, yeah. is because activity levels are high enough that they push demand above supply and put a lot of stress on the system that creates that backwardation due to lower inventories. We think we're going into an environment like that. That's what's going to be really driving our outlook here. I just want to be clear about this because we had this discussion about five, ten minutes ago with Steve Rizzuto of Mizuho. This difference between activity levels and where other people see economic growth. Draw the distinction for me again. Okay, when we think about the, 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 the first half of the business cycle. We like to say you're below capacity and growth. So supply is up here, demand's down yeah. here. Now, if I tell you the demand growth rate is 20%, you know that it's going to cross supply at some point in time. 
financial instruments, bonds and equities, trade off of growth rates because that tells you when the two are going to cross. In contrast, do I want to be long oil with supplies up here and demands down here? No, you're in a surplus. So when do I want to be long oil? Soon as demand crosses supply and you end up in a deficit. So when we think about financial markets, they trade off growth rates of underlying GDP. Yeah. Real assets trade off of activity levels. And so when we, I, let's just, let's, let's agree with Steve's assumption that activity sure. levels are likely to, growth rates are slow down. That doesn't mean the, excuse me, growth rates are likely to slow down. It doesn't mean the activity level is going to dip. It means the activity growth rates would just slow, but you're still going to end up with demand above supply. So, so an additional point then, because you would get some pushback in the sense then, what about if we got this fiscal stimulus from Washington, D.C.? You're saying that the bond market will adjust, the FX market will probably adjust, but the fundamentals of commodities are still bullish? Absolutely. And, the, and one of the key reasons goes back to that point is once you have a deficit where demand is above supply, you draw your inventories, you get the backwardated forward curve that we were referring to earlier, that is what generates the turns and creates a bullish outlook on commodities. Jeff, is this one of the reasons that we see a stronger dollar but we don't see the reaction in the commodity market that traditionally we would normally see? Actually, traditionally, I, I, I disagree with that term because it, that correlation between oil in the dollar existed from 2003 through 2016. And actually, what happened between 2003 and 2016? an enormous rise in excess savings and a decline in excess savings. And you look at that dollar movement in the oil correlation, it correlates to when the excess savings went up. Think about this. Yeah. In 2003, Saudi Arabia, let's go back, actually, I want to go back to that point about in Houston, that, that ban on prices was 55 to 65, tightest we've seen in 15 years. We go back to 2003, Saudi plans for 20, gets 30. Look at all that excess savings. 2004, they planned for maybe 23 and got 40. 2005, they planned for 25 and got 65. The point being is they had all those excess dollars that then weighed on the dollar. So oil prices went up, new dollars weighed on the dollar. 2014, they planned for 90 and yeah. get 70. 2015, planned for 85 and get 50. And you can see they're sucking dollars off the market. Now, as I just said before, a lot of confidence that that long-term oil price is somewhere between 55 and 65. They plan for 60 and get, let's say, 58. We're going back to an environment similar to the 80s and 90s where they plan for 20 and get, let's say, 1850. Plan for 20 and get 2250. Yeah. And I, that will take the correlation between the oil and dollar out of the system. So hey, it goes Jeff. back to this point. We have certainty over the long-term supply. It's, it's been great to have you with us to get your thoughts.